Frank Palooka lived here during the turn of the century. He died from a rattlesnake bite in 1936 and is buried with the snake. Let's go down the road a little further. I want to show you a really cool campsite next to the lake. The Forest Service has put up barricades so that you don't park too close to the lake. This is a good place to camp. American beautyberry bushes keep the mosquitoes away. Turf cap uh, provide uh, edible greens. The flowers are sweet and the young leaves, the tender leaves are tasty. Uh, I like them just as a salad raw or they can be cooked. And then passion vines. The leaves provide a relaxation tea and the flowers are a tasty garnish. You only have to carry your camping gear a few feet. My gear is reminiscent of that which was used for wagon camping during the late 1800s. Cast iron cookware, kerosene lantern, and a hammock made from a bed sheet. This is the second time for me to use this hammock. Last time I held it up with poles and ropes. This time I attached it to trees and it's much more secure. At the dawn of the century, hammocks were very popular for wagon camping. Uh, sleeping on platforms was also popular. But I opted for simplicity. The bed sheet hammock is described in a previous video. It's attached to the trees with a timber hitch at one end and a slippery hitch at the other. The mosquito screen is attached to the ridge line with Prusik knots so that I can slip it back and forth easily. It is difficult to control the heat when cooking on a traditional campfire. A trench fire solves this problem. It is fuel efficient, produces very little smoke, and allows you to cook several pans at once, individually adjusting the heat for each pan. American pioneers in the 1800s frequently used trench fires for cooking. The Prairie Traveler Handbook, published by the U.S. War Department in 1861, recommended this style for cooking. The meals for this camping trip are from the Food Journal of Lewis and Clark, Recipes for an Expedition. President Thomas Jefferson commissioned Lewis and Clark to lead the first expedition across the western half of this continent from 1804 to 1806. The purpose was to establish an American presence in this territory before Britain and other European powers tried to claim it. The campaign's secondary objective was to study the plants and animals and geography and establish trade with native people. The maps and journals are very impressive, providing a wealth of, of information from which we can learn a great deal. Although the expedition carried 3,500 pounds of supplies, they soon discovered that they didn't bring enough corn. Corn was a staple. So the blacksmiths traded their labor for corn. And they used this corn in two different recipes for making parched corn. 
In the first recipe, they used sweet corn or green corn, and they would cut it from the cob and they would fry it in a small amount of oil. Our modern sweet corn is much sweeter than what was available in the 1800s. In the second recipe, they used dried corn, dried mature corn. Mature corn hardens as the moisture evaporates. It doesn't shrivel. This is parched dried corn. It's different from sweet corn or soft corn. Now after parching it, it becomes easy to chew. Take a little bit of water and it'll swell up in your stomach and you'll feel full. For dinner tonight, I'm following recipes from March 28, 1804. Clark wrote, I had corn parched to make a parched meal. First, corn and dried meat soup. It's really simple to make. Some green onions, parched sweet corn, dried beef, little salt and pepper, and vegetable oil. Second, we're having greens. These are locally collected greens. And then for dessert, corn pudding. Native Americans had a long history of, of preparing ground cornmeal and making puddings and breads. Newly arrived Europeans added cornmeal to their own puddings, which were often rich in eggs, milk, and spices. Bon Appetit, Passion Vine Tea, mm. Parched Corn Soup, Greens, and these are Turks Cap, full of vitamins and minerals, and a sort of a sweet flavor. They're really excellent. And then Corn Pudding. Mm. Tastes a little bit like pumpkin pie. I'm going for a sunset swim. The lantern will help me find my way back. Because it might be dark. Let's see. That should work. This has been so much fun. I guess it's time to dry off and hit the sack. Sweet dreams! Que era importante conectarse con la tierra. Tener esa conexión con quien nos da el sustento. 
Pero no solamente el sustento de las plantas, de las flores, de los árboles y de las verduras, sino también el cobijo para la flora y la fauna. Nuestras culturas sabían que era importante. Good morning. I had a good night. But boy, I had weird dreams. The sun's coming up. Wow, it's pretty. Here. For breakfast, I'm making cornmeal mush with cheese. In previous videos, I made hoe cakes and ash cakes. These are very simple ways to enjoy cornmeal cooked directly over a campfire. Cornmeal mush is a sophisticated cousin. You can still find it called cheese grits on restaurant menus and in homes throughout the South. It's simple to make. Some cornmeal, salt, grated cheese, a little bit of butter. I bring it, I add a, a little bit of water, bring it to a boil, stir it. You can eat it fresh right after you've made it, or you can cool it off, refrigerate it now, and then cut it up and fry it. I'm having passion vine tea, cornmeal mush and cheese, garnished with passion vine flour. Passion vine flowers are really tasty. They're, they're sweet, healthy, full of antioxidants. Bon appetit. This has been a fun weekend. I, I really enjoy it here. You know, swimming in the lake, walking the trails, there aren't very many mosquitoes, thanks to the American Beauty Berry. Fantastic food. It's time to head home now. And so, until next time, peace.